Hello, everyone. This is your host, Susan Rosen. And my guest this week is, and I'm probably going to murder this. In fact, I may, Andy, why don't you tell us your last name here? Yeah, Andy Chan. And my yeah. Chinese name is Chi Chu, but I go, I go by Andy everywhere I go. So Andy okay. Chan is perfect. Okay. I wasn't sure. I, for some reason, I thought that the three were all part of your name, but obviously I was wrong. Okay. Hey, good that you asked. Good that you asked. You made sure that nobody was offended. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Glad you picked up on that. This is going to be a great interview. <laughs> it's going to be lovely. Okay. So let me tell you, tell everybody a little bit about you, which is Andy has a genuine passion for making a positive impact in the fitness industry through learning and sharing different unique methodologies. He currently teaches education courses on behalf of companies such as the National Academy of Sports Medicine, TRX, Trigger Point Performance, and Power Plate. He has made guest appearances in Hong, on Hong Kong television shows. Oh, I see, in Hong Kong television shows, my mistake, as well as presenting at different public fitness events. Okay, so. Do you help help some of these companies in in creating their products or maybe their programs or or all of that? Yeah, sometimes we do, uh, but mostly I deliver education courses for them. So usually these companies they would have one day, two day, or a few weeks of of courses of education courses that coaches would like to enroll in to learn more mm -hmm. about their respective training philosophy. And so I'll deliver education content on behalf of the companies. Okay, and when you say education content, is that how to use the pro, how to use the products, or or why they develop them, or who they're for, or yeah, all of that because I I think that you know nowadays if you go online, if you look at different fitness instructors, or even if you walk inside the gym, there are thousands of different equipment available. Oh. So I I think what what we ought to do is to really learn about the product or training philosophy. Uh, from the inside out so that we can just kind of introduce to the trainers so that they understand what this tool is for and how to use it so that they don't just kind of go in and do random stuff with it as they often okay. do. Yes. Yes. I oh, know. Exactly. Exactly. And a lot of these things, I mean, I know like TRX I'm familiar with, um, you can really get hurt with that if you don't know what you're doing and you try and get, start using it on your own. Yeah. I, I, although I would say that the, the, most most of the times, the saying that you might get hurt without a trainer is is, is often used as a scare tactic uh, applied oh, by yeah. the commercial gym trainers because, you know, in all fairness, it, it's it's quite difficult to get hurt in the gym just because you're not really lifting that heavy if you're just going on your own really. But yeah. you're right, there's still a chance of injury because you could accumulate bad posture and it could accumulate mm -hmm. and and you yeah. could get pain as often as the case. Um, but I would say. Yes, that's why we're there to make sure that we educate others, we empower others. So my whole training philosophy mm -hmm. is I want to teach people a philosophy or just some guiding principles so that mm -hmm. they can use this mm -hmm. to look at different movements. Because, you know, okay. what I think is a waste of everyone's time is people thinking that I need a trainer to be with me for every single exercise. Because oh, it turns yeah. out there are just overall guiding principles that we could follow so mm -hmm. that we will know, regardless of the movement we're doing, we'll know whether we're doing it right or not. And, and mm -hmm. that's what I, I'm passionate about. Uh-huh. No, and, and I, I would agree. I would agree. I just think that there are some things, and and like I say, TRX is really the only one. Actually, I think I've seen, I've seen power, power Plate before as well. But TRX, because of the way it is, and you're kind of up off the ground and stuff, if you don't have someone showing you the correct way to do it, right? I'm not saying that somebody has to be there with you for the rest of your life whenever you use it, but someone needs to show you how it works. Someone yes. who use, maybe uses it, a trainer, whoever, don't just get on there and try and guess. Yeah about what you're supposed to do. Because I know for myself, I, you know, I felt like I was gonna hurt myself and I even sure. had a trainer there, so. 
Sure. Well, well, guess what? You, I, I'm going to take that one step further and, and ask uh-huh. that usually, you know, if you do, if you do TRX exercises or any exercises for uh-huh. anyone that's listening, whenever you hire a trainer in those trial sessions, the trainer is going to ask you to do stuff, right? Do this exercise, uh-huh. do that exercise. Next time you need to ask that trainer. So show me 10 repetitions first, because uh-huh. guess what? A lot of the trainers actually cannot do the exercise. They're very good at prescribing exercises. Uh-huh. But you're going to see when they do 10 of them, they're going to be shaking. And that's when you know, hey, I want the next guy uh, because I want 10 perfect rep de- de- demonstration. Yeah. Okay. That's so good tip number advice. two, find, find someone who can actually do the exercises. Yeah. Yeah. And, and probably tell you in a little more detail what it's going to help and yeah. why are you doing it and right all of that. Yeah. And, you know, for example, TRX is actually the company that inspired me to pursue more of this movement based yeah. training approach. So uh-huh. um, so I think this would be, this would be a perfect uh, segue into kind of who I train. So I, I, okay. I would say 50, 60 percent of my clients are over the age of 50. And, mm-hmm. and a lot of times they, they will come in and in the first session, they might ask, oh, Andy, so what is your training philosophy? Because, you know, obviously people have different, different trainers will have different emphasis. And I usually tell them that I am a firm believer in movement-based training. And they're like, what is that? Okay. Because most people above the age of 50, when they think of fitness, they just think of these boring machines. So there might be, you know, if you go to commercial gym in, in California, uh, Gold's Gym, for example, you're going to yeah. find that there are many different pieces of equipment. And, and what these equipment share in common is that they work particular muscle groups. So if you approach the machine and you look on the machine, it will tell you, oh, this is working my lats. This is working my pecs, et cetera. Now, when it comes to movement-based training, instead of training isolated muscles, we're looking for movement. Reason being, uh, well, what are, well, let me tell you what are movements. Well, for example, we do squats, we do lunges, um, mm-hmm. we do push, we do pull, we do rotation. And the reason why we do that is because from – Day to day, let's say today, if you are to pick up groceries or if you, if you are to pick up your grandkids or if you are to push a heavy cart in the grocery, mm-hmm. in the grocery store, you don't really think about which muscle you're using, mm-hmm. right? So let's say if you're working on a curb and you're about to fall and you're saving yourself from the trip, you know, you just kind of activate your muscles. And, and turns out whenever we play sports, great athletes, they don't think about which, which muscles you're using. Think about you shooting a basketball. Right. I mean, when you shoot a basketball, do you really think about using your legs, your core, and then your triceps? No, you just shoot the ball. Uh, yet somehow in the fitness industry, because people are working towards a better physique, they ignore that mm-hmm. and, and they decide to work on isolated muscles. So uh-huh. the first thing I tell them is that movement-based training is more natural because if we can move better inside the gym, I'm really, I'm absolutely sure and certain uh-huh. that you move better outside the gym. And, and that's what... Uh-huh health and fitness is all about. So that, that is all because of TRX that I got into this movement-based training approach. Oh, interesting. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, and it, it makes a lot of sense as well when you do any kind of training that you really want to work on all parts of your body, because if one part of it's not, if one part of it is you're not working on it and then it get, gets weaker because you're not using it. And then some other one is, is, stronger you get kind of out of balance you know you're absolutely right susan because <laughs> well we, well we know from biomechanics biomechanics mm-hmm. which is the study of physics on human body in sports mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and we know that take a baseball play for example so today you're up you're about to hit the ball and mm-hmm. we know that there is a proper sequence we all know there's an optimal proper sequence for you to generate power so that you can hit a home run right now let's say if you're just working on isolated muscles, if one muscle becomes significantly stronger than the other, just because you want it to look bigger, then that's going to mess up the entire sequence mm-hmm. and, and, and it's going to hurt your performance. Now, you know, we must look at both sides. Those who argue for isolated muscle training usually are arguing it for physique purposes, which is fine mm-hmm. because, you know, some people just want to look better. Uh, but but, but my, my argument always comes in the form of, well, if we want to just kind of live naturally, then I would say total body movement will make, mm-hmm. will make much more sense as it translates to everyday life. Mm-hmm. No, that makes a lot of, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would agree. So let's see, just looking at, at some of your, your background and stuff here. So 
do you do you get into all of um like it says up here like diet and and different soft tissue health and and things like that so do you work with people on on that whole the whole gamut of yeah health <laughs> yeah well actually, i really like I really liked uh, what you just said about, you know, working on a body part and overlooking others. And Uh and turns out it could actually be applied to the whole fitness thing as well. Because if you think about the fitness or health and fitness industry, these days, all you have to do is go online and look for different information. You'll find that, okay, you've got health coaches, you've got fitness coaches, you've got uh, nutrition experts, dietitians, et cetera. You've got sports psychologists, and you've got the sports medicine professionals who do I go to? Because they all seem to have a different perspective on things. And one thing, one person says one, the other said the other. Well, my goal is to integrate all of that because I believe that if we just look at one thing in isolation, then we're overlooking other aspects of life. So uh, usually when people come in, I look, I just talk to them about three aspects of lifestyle. And that is number one, training, which is the bread and butter of my profession and what I do. Mm-hmm. And we mm-hmm. talk about their diet, and then we talk about the way they manage their emotions. So three things that we, we look at, mm-hmm. um, assuming that they're normal, because I don't diagnose any problems. And, and as I right, said, you're not a doctor. Yeah, I'm not a doctor, not a physician. Um, right. but, but I do believe general principles can guide us through a long way. Because if you look at different historical cultures, we're all guided by the same principles when it comes to mm-hmm. diet and, and emotions and training. So that's mm-hmm. what I, I ought to do. I look at the connection between the three. No, that, and that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense because if you're not, if you're not eating well, and if you're not getting some kind of exercise, then the odds are you're not going to be very happy. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So, but people, but it's so funny because so many people don't, don't put them together. They don't. Yeah. Well, I, I can tell everyone, you know, before this conversation, so before we started recording this podcast, we're just uh-huh. chatting, chit-chatting, uh, yeah. me and Susan, and we uh, we were talking about the political situation. And I just want to use this example to illustrate how our, our diet and emotions and our training are, mm-hmm. are actually linked, right? So politics is a topic that, you know, it, it triggers us. I, believe, mm-hmm. I think for most people, it just gets us going, regardless of whatever we believe in. And, mm-hmm. and I, I want to start by talking about two nervous system responses. So in the brain, we have the fight or flight and we have the rest and digest, which we probably have heard of. And mm-hmm. in the fight or flights, it is a, in this move, our minds are upregulated. So we're stressed, we're ready to go, we're ready to fight because there's a perceived threat. Mm-hmm. Now in politics, you know, whenever people, especially when they don't share the same value as us, we oh, feel yeah. like there's a threat to our identity. So that, that we, we are triggered and we, we, we get into that fight or flight mode. Now yeah. in that fight or flight mode, if you think about it, really thousands of years ago, we would be sitting under a tree enjoying our meal and then a bear or a lion might show up right in front of us. Now that is the real fight or flight instance because you either fight a bear or you die yeah. uh, or you run away from it. So yeah. if you think about it, at that time, whenever we're in fight or flight, our digestive system is, is temporary shut off so that mm-hmm. other parts of the body can utilize our resources. So blood flow mm-hmm. can go into the body. So in terms of the physical body, we become more rigid because we are ready to fight or leave, which means my muscles and my soft tissue has to be rigid and stiff. Okay. And, and, and as I said, the digestive system is temporary, kind of shut down a little bit so that we can, other parts of the body can utilize these resources or uh, right. can you realize blood flow? And, and this can be perfectly illustrated by the fact that a lot of times when we're nervous, you can feel that our, our stomach, our stomach is a bit upset. Like a, mm. like you mm. feel like there's butterflies in your stomach. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. And, and so all that to say, whenever we're stressed or when there's a perceived threat, then we don't digest well. And then we become stiff. Well, but think about it with the constant stimulus that we have these days, we're, we're constantly in that fight or flight. I mean, just yeah. again, I go on social media. I'm like, oh, I roll my eyes and I roll my eyes, roll my eyes. And then I get, I get mad. I get mad. And so yeah. it doesn't matter what we eat, right? It doesn't matter what we eat. You can right. eat the healthiest superfood that you have. You can have the great exercise routine. You can do the perfect stuff. But, you know, if you just stress all the time, then none of that makes sense. So mm-hmm. that's why we, we, we have to look at the, the interconnectedness of the three because it turns out we need rest and digest 
every single day throughout the day so that we can just downregulate, we can digest and we can become a, uh, a little bit less stiff because a lot of people mm-hmm. over 50, they'll come in and they'll be like, oh, I'm stiff. I haven't been able to touch my hamstrings for, for my entire life. And, and often that is actually a result of them being in car- chronic stress. Uh, okay. Okay. No, that, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. I will. And I know a lot of people who, um, you know, use going to the gym as a way to, um, let go of a lot of the stress that they have. Yeah. And I think that is, that is great. Yeah. But I would just be mindful of the fact that they don't go too hard. Meaning, right. because a lot of times people think that we have to go to the gym today and right. there's just no pain, no gain. And I must work to the best of my, my abilities because I must be a go-getter. But oftentimes uh, it's, it's the, uh, you know, low intensity training. Actually, there's a lot of benefit attached to it mm-hmm. as well. So people yeah. don't necessarily have to go super hard every single day. Right. right. Oh, no, I agree. I agree. Yeah. And especially as you get older, I mean, it's not that you can't do things, but you some sometimes you have to kind of back off a little bit, you know. I mean, I used to I used to run, you know, like five six miles, and and work out with weights and the whole thing. And well, since COVID, I haven't been to the gym because my gym closed, so that took care of that. But you know, now now I'm just my husband and I go out and we walk. You know, and we have some we have some weights that we bought ourselves to start using at home, but that that's that's about it. I mean, I I, mi- I actually miss yeah. you know being able to to do more. So, well, I'll anything? tell you one of the more I'll tell you one of the more uh, challenging things working with people over fifty, and and uh-huh. that is. You know, thankfully and gratefully, I, I get to work with some successful businessmen in, in, in Hong ah. Kong because of my profile. Um, okay. And and so I'll say working with them sometimes, uh, the, the most challenging thing is to manage their egos and and their self-esteem because, you know, to be honest, yeah. when you're 50 years old, you, you don't move as well as you did, you do, you did before, no. which means that we have to have a longer warm-up which means that we have to do small exercises that work on different stabilizing muscles, which uh-huh. means that it takes longer to get into it, which means that if they take three weeks off, we have to start all over again and start easy. Um, okay. And we don't have a crushing session every single time. And, yes. and, and that is quite hard because a lot of clients, you know, I trained this client who's 70 just last week and he used to be mm-hmm. a, a semi-pro tennis player and then he will come in and, and obviously he wants to do heavy stuff. He's like, I'm an athlete. And, and I tell him, well, we've got to take it one step at a time. And, yeah. and quite often that is a difficult message to keep in mind. Yeah, no, ab- absolutely. Absolutely. Especially, especially for people who who have spent their whole lives or most of their lives working out, maybe they were athletes, you know, earlier, um, and they just think, well, I, I, I used to be able to do that. I should be able to do that. And then, then they go and they just do it. And then, you know, you have to take them to the hospital. <laughs> well, thankfully, none for me so far. Okay. None for me so far. <laughs> but you're, you're right. I think it takes a bit longer uh, to, to get into it. Yeah. 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 No, no, I understand. I understand. I'm at the ones that, not the ones training with you, the ones who just go and, to the gym themselves right yeah and, and just go at it and, and, and yeah. i say no you gotta take you gotta plan it out take it easy first oh yeah 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 absolutely i mean because it's very it's, i you know going to the hospital is probably a little bit extreme but it's very easy to pull a pull a muscle or strain something or um, yeah it is very easy and and let me explain why yeah. because i i think we so now that we've established we need to warm up, but we right. haven't really talked about why, why we need to warm up. And, and that is, if you think about, again, uh, let's build on what we've talked about so far, which is the fight, fight or flight. And you know, right. I'm upregulated, I'm downregulated. When I'm upregulated, which means I'm stiff, hmm. you know, you sit in the office, you sit in your chair, you're reading the news, you're watching TV, you just idle, okay? You're sitting there. And then you drive 20 minutes, 30 minutes to go to the gym. Mm-hmm. which means you're also stiff because you're, you're seating, you, yeah. you're see, seated inside a car, hunched yeah, over. Yeah, the traffic. 
<laughs> and the traffic, especially California, where you're, where you're at, Susan. And, and then you go there and you're like, I'm going to crack it out. But that's not going to help because your muscles are stiff. We want the muscle to be pliable because think about athletic performance. If you think about jumping or playing basketball, the greatest athletes are the ones who can utilize the stretching principle of the muscle because muscle is elastic, oh. right? You want okay. to store energy. It's like a rubber band. You want to store energy. You want to let go of the rubber band and, and the rubber band oh. shoots uh, and contracts okay. and it produces energy. So when your muscles are overly stiff and it doesn't really stretch, then it's one, it doesn't really produce power in optimally. And two, mm. whenever you land, because it is so stiff, it doesn't act as a buffer. So your joints um. has to take uh, the blunt of that load. And, and so we, we, we say that it, the warm up is important because we can restore, uh, our, our soft tissue, our muscles to a better state than before, before we work out. So this okay. is, so the next time when you go in and tell others, Oh, you have to warm up. Don't tell them because you're old, uh, but to, to tell them that actually it's the same thing for all ages. And that is our current lifestyle makes us so stiff. Uh huh. And it's, it just so happens that perhaps 50-year-olds sit a bit more than the average 20, 30-year-olds. And, and that's why we need more time to reverse um, the, the, the nature, the, riches, the rigidity of, of the soft tissue. And, and that uh, is why okay. warming up is so important. Okay. Okay. And, and that, that's stretching and... Those I think for, for, for most people, like... breathing would, would they would be great starting off with breathing. So, and, and here I'm not talking about breathing in the meditation sense yeah. because in, 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 in the fitness industry, we will go, let's do meditation. Yeah. Me, I, I think that's for, for most people in Hong Kong that I work with one hour meditation class, one hour meditation is impractical uh, because mm. they're just not going to do it. Okay. I already know. And so what I propose is they do breathing exercises throughout the day. So here in Hong oh. Kong, many skyscrapers, okay. we, you've got to wait for the lift for at least three, four minutes. And to me, three, four minutes is fine. And, yeah. and we do breathing exercises. What breathing exercises? Uh, and, and those are deep breathing exercises, which means that we take a deep inhale through the nose all the way to our belly button. Um, because a lot of times okay. when we breathe nowadays, we can try, if you're listening to this podcast right now, I want you to try two things. One mm -hmm. is, I assume that you're sitting. So now try to hunch over and just try to take a deep breath through your nose. And then exhale. Then the second one, you're going to try to sit upright, open up your chest, and then you're going to do a deep inhale again. If you're sitting in a car, please be mindful of surroundings. Take a deep <laughs> inhale. <laughs> Take a do deep it inhale. after you part. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Take a deep inhale. And then out. Did you feel the difference, Susan? Oh, my God, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. What, what yeah. was the difference? Well, first off, the, the, I could take a much deeper breath. And number two, I could exhale it all out. Yeah. And it was going to yeah. get caught back still in here. Yeah. Yeah. So our body position actually it dictates how, how the deafness of, of right. our breathing. And, okay. and so you see that again, these are two, these two are linked because nowadays we sit in a hunchback posture. So in a hunchback posture, we take uh, shallow breaths. And when we take shallow breaths, we get, we get stressed. And when mm -hmm. we're stressed or we look at the news, we get more stressed. And, and so the first, so the first thing that we need to do is breathing deep breaths. And that, that begins by us being in an upright open posture. So I do this when I'm waiting, uh, for the elevator. And most importantly, I do this before and after my meals, you know, how, like sometimes we, nowadays we cook a meal or if we eat outside, we yeah. order our meals and we just sit down. Uh, most people we we'll just look at their phones, you know, just to kill time. Oh, let, let me watch, let me look at the phone to see if there's anything new because they mm -hmm. cannot stand the boredom that comes with doing nothing, obviously. And, and I so don't I just have that problem, but there are a lot of younger people in particular. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and I tell them that it's fine. You should just do nothing because if you stress yourself out, you're not going to digest food very well. But, yeah. you know, it's, it's the fear of missing out that's coming into play. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely breathe, breathe throughout the day. Yeah, no, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. You know, breathing period, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, it, it, it helps you to stay alive, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Minimal breathing helps you stay alive, but if we don't fully utilize, you know, the power of breath, yeah. then we're just stressed all day. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no, exactly. Exactly. 
but it, you know, even then taking deep breaths, you know, during the day, it just makes your brain do better and everything. It does. And, and I think most importantly, it is manageable and it is applicable because yeah, one of my pet peeves in the fitness industry is that people come on and they share about a thousand things that they should do. And if you think about the 10 things that they tell you to do, nine things you won't do. I mean, you would do for like two days and then the third day you'd be like, I'm going to give up. But if you think about breathing, I mean, seriously, I think you could do it anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I don't see anyone not applying it, at least the people that I train. Because I just tell them to work on, you know, two things in the elevator. One, you when you're waiting for the elevator, you work on your breathing. Two, when you're in the elevator, you work on your balance, assuming that no one is in, is in the elevator. Yeah. Now, I okay. understand in, in the US, people don't necessarily live in an apartment complex with an elevator, but whenever True. they have a minute or two, let's say if they're just waiting yeah. for a table, mm -hmm. you just stand on one leg. Now, yeah, I, I understand. I might, yeah. yeah, yeah, because for most people over 50, we have to start training for better balance and, and mm -hmm. better understanding of the body, better awareness, mm -hmm. uh, because essen if, essentially, we want to minimize the occurrence of falls. And, and mm -hmm. a lot of times in fall prevention, you know, they, will, they will talk about the critical uh, importance of balance training. So we do two of that yeah. in, in, in the elevator or whenever we're waiting. Yeah, no, and that, that makes so much sense. I try and do that as well um, and make sure that there's a wall or something I can fall against. <laughs> yes. Just put my arm up, yeah. you know, if I do start to go to go over because it's easy yeah. yep 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 yeah i think Especially that's if great you are you in the it. elevator yeah <laughs> the elevator you know moves it's a, a little wobbly. bit yeah 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 it makes it it makes a, a big difference it really does yeah i know oh, because I, I i think all these things it just points to how can we achieve longevity because yeah. um like where I'm from. So I used to spend 10 years in the United States and, but I'm, I'm originally from Hong Kong, from Chinese culture. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whenever you come to China, you can see a lot of uh, older people. They're quite lean. They're quite skinny. And yet they're walking fine. You know, my grandpa, before he passed away, he was still buying his own groceries at 88, 89. And, and my grandma was the same. And, and a lot of people were, were agile and, and they were fine. And so uh -huh. when I was writing, when I'm training, when I'm developing my training philosophy, I wanted to incorporate, I guess, elements of Chinese medicine because that's what the culture is driven by. And, and essentially what they look at is it's, it's a preventative medicine and they want to know how can we live in the most natural way so that we can prevent illnesses. And, and that's kind of the topic that I've been interested in as well on top of these diet emotions and training. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's all part. They're all, wrapped up together right yeah they're all wrapped up together and 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 in fact that's why when you go to a chinese medicine practitioner they look at everything so they'll come in they'll ask you questions about different aspects of your lifestyle whereas in the west perhaps you just go to a specialist for the respective fields now obviously there are benefits to both sides because in the in the in the states when you go to a specialist mm -hmm. You know, let's say they're the specialists of a particular body part, the foot, for example, you know, they, they see a thousand foots a day. So you can be sure that they are the absolute expert in that area. But the problem is, again, it goes back to if we just train in one area, we, we neglect other areas of the body. And, and that's what happens. You've, you solve one problem, but then you realize that maybe the root cause is something in the lower back, for example. And, and so one yeah. good thing about Chinese medicine is that they, they look at the entire body. So absolutely, the, the best practice is to do a bit of both, uh, at least in my yeah. opinion, so that you can take the best of both worlds. Oh, no, I agree. I agree. I mean, I think a perfect example of that is headaches. Oh, there are yeah. so many different parts of your body that could be causing a headache. And very few of them are actually up here. <laughs> yeah, you're right. And, you know, but again, if you go to a, if you go to a, a regular, regular doctor, you know, they're going to start asking you questions about something that probably has absolutely nothing to do with what's causing your headache, yeah. unless they're, unless they're an unusual doctor. I mean, there are some these days, right. Who, who have expanded their education, particularly with some of the, the Asian types of practices, but yeah. And 
know, you got to find one of those. Yeah. And I also think, you know, when it comes to headaches, it, it's so complicated <laughs> because mm-hmm. there's, there are literally thousands of reasons that might cause you a headache, right? From anything, I don't yeah. know, you might be a stressful person or you might actually be sick and you didn't drink enough water, you're out for too long today. And, and, and this yeah. all just points to how the human body is just fascinating because you, we actually yeah. know so little about the human body, really. Yeah. And, and that's why I actually encourage everyone to read more about different perspectives because you're going to find that ancient cultures, you know, if you look at not only the Chinese culture, right? If you look at kind of how the Egyptians looked after it, if you look at how the West looked at it, it it's, mm-hmm. it's fascinating. Um, certainly mm-hmm. when it comes to diet as well, right? If, if we travel oh to God, different yeah. parts of the world, the first thing that we usually do is check out their local cuisine. Um, and, and, and it's, it's nice to do that. Um, but you'll find that actually most cultures, they, they do share some commonalities and that is mm-hmm. the often, uh, most of the diets that I refer to as healthy, uh, quote unquote healthy, usually they're made with fresh fruits or fresh, uh, foods, mm-hmm. fresh ingredients and, and they eat everything. I mean, it's, it, there's so few cultures parts, like, right? like all yeah. parts like America that it's just processed foods and so limited in, in the variety that people eat. Well, not everybody in the U S yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're right. Processed foods. <laughs> yeah. There's, well, it's, it's certainly improving. Uh, it's certainly improving. I'm, sh- I'm for sure people are a lot more health conscious, which is always nice because when I was there in 2004 to 2014, mm-hmm. people would, 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 would gross out even if I eat a duck, you know, in, in the Vietnamese culture. Really? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, where, where I was from, at least in the small sample size of Bloomington, Indiana, in, in the university. Oh, well, no wonder. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> as well as in Connecticut, uh, people be like, what, you eat a duck? I didn't think you could eat a duck. And, uh, <laughs> and I'd be like, okay, sure. Yeah. And, and uh, intestines, I can understand a little bit because in, in Hong Kong, half of the people are a bit grossed out by intestines just because we're quite westernized in this city. Um, but it, it's always good to eat everything. Yeah. Oh no, I agree. I agree. I love duck. My mother, my mother actually made, used to make duck when I was oh. growing up. So that was a long time ago, a very long time ago. Um, <laughs> but I, and my mother in town, my mother loved intestines, absolutely oh. adored them. I never developed the taste for them. It wasn't that I didn't try them and it had nothing to do with what it was. I didn't just didn't like the taste. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I guess the taste, it, it's heavily dependent on how you cook it, I guess. That's true. Yeah. Because it's yeah. It, it, it's not that flavorful. It's more the texture sometimes that, like for my wife, you know, it's the yeah, texture that's that throws. Good point. Yeah. That yeah. Didn't, that didn't help either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyways, yeah, I think we should uh, explore different, different diets and just try to eat different foods if possible. I agree. Well, and you know, I guess that, I guess I'm spoiled because I was born and raised in California, in Los Mm. Angeles, and then moved up to Northern California. So I've always been exposed to a lot of different cultures and a lot of different kinds of food. Yeah. Um, And food in general is quite fresh in in the area because you're obviously close to the shore and the ocean. And we grow a lot of it. Yeah. Good soil. So it's a, it's a fantastic place to live in, I think. Yeah, it is. It is, except for the fires, but we won't go there. That's uh, <laughs> way too depressing. Um, but anyways, point, point being, I, I think you're right. I mean, we, we have a, Americans have a, a reputation for, how do I say this nicely? Not being as open to other cultures and their, foods and practices and and all of that yeah i often think it's 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 kind of funny and ironic because um obviously american way the american way is the gold standard for a lot of the industries and certainly it it is the case in the fitness industry right we talked about the organization that Mm -hmm. i'm part of right the national academy of sports medicine trx power plate etc you know they're all american Mm -hmm. yeah and and it's funny because in nutritional studies, the American diet is also used as a benchmark. But I always think that's funny and ironic because everybody knows that the American diet is not perfect. And, and, and 
and so I just find it funny that even now in, in different parts of the different parts of Asia, people mm-hmm. are adopting the American way of eating. Meaning, really? so we, we all know the Asian way of eating is, eating is communal. So you have, yeah. you have dishes on the table, you share the dishes, you have a good chat versus uh-huh. the, the classical American dad, it, it's a bit more isolated because I, I order my own food and, and I right. just eat whatever. And they bring it to you. Yeah. They bring it to you. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but now more and more people are doing that because they, they think that we can better count calories and we can do that because I mean, I understand. Right. If you do communal sharing, if you just have if you have potluck today, for example, mm-hmm. it's a bit troublesome to count your calories just because oh I don't know how many uh, how much rice I've had after three rounds mm. of of mm. getting it and I have no idea mm. I'm not gonna weigh it every single time certainly that's the argument um, but to to that I would actually argue and and put out a point that we haven't been counting calories in however many years that we have existed. And, and yet counting calories has been around. It's, it's, it's kind of the prominent thing over the past few years uh, because we're all bio, biochemists all of a sudden. Um, and, and so for me, actually, I, I, I don't count calories uh, just no. because I, I, I know that if I eat naturally, That's if right. I eat a bit of everything, I, I, I will That's get right. enough. And yeah, and yeah. yeah. And you don't sc- stuff yourself. I don't stuff myself and I don't get stressed out because once you start counting calories, have I met my needs today or have I gone over Mm -hmm. and am I counting it right? I mean, there are things that I could go go, go into. And so, especially for, for people um, that are listening in today, know that, you know, a lot of people, they, they live all around the world. They don't count calories. They just eat a bit of everything, whatever that comes in and they eat till 70, 80% full and they live a happy, happy life. So yeah, definitely yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah. There used to be, and I can't remember who used to say this, but one of the nutritionists here in the U.S. used to always say to, um, when you eat food, um, eat, I can't remember. No, I'm not, I'm gonna, I'm gonna butcher it. Um, oh, just butcher it, just pretend. Yeah, well, just, essentially you what, he, what he used to say was eat natural, you know, eat, eat small portions or no, eat, eat natural and, um, and just enough. Ah, yeah. Because it won't be as taxing for it. So people ask, what do you mean mm-hmm. just enough? And, and why, again, we have to understand the why in order to really hit us. And, and that is because whenever we eat too much, it's too taxing for our digestive system. Yeah. And, and whenever our digestive system, so our digestive um, our gut is actually called the second brain now because we realize right. that there are yeah finally uh, it, it, yeah yeah it communicates a lot with the brain and we all know after a terrible meal or after a super full meal we just don't feel well and no. and and so the next time when you're about to stuff yourself ask yourself are you really happy and satisfied after a full really really full meal well not really no. because i would say i would argue that we're the best at that like 80 percent mark 70 80 yeah. percent that's yeah. probably when you feel the most fulfilled and and you don't want to kill yourself in the long run. Um, no, and, no. And so no, just treat your gut no. a bit better. That's absolutely. And take the leftovers home. Yeah. You know, it's not like you, you don't have to leave it on the table. Yeah, you don't. Yeah. And yeah. And and <laughs> on that note, yes. I think a health decision that we can all make sometimes is when we're eating out, you can, we can also try to order less sauce or less dressing because that's my observation. I mean, sometimes I go on these restaurants yeah. and I go on and, and, and okay, mashed potatoes, fine. And then the gravy, geez, they're like drinking it because it's like more, more gravy, more gravy. And so just cut that down, cut that out, enjoy the natural taste. But again, if the, if the food that you're consuming is fresh enough, there should be a natural sweetness to it. So if you need a lot of gravy, if you need a lot of seasoning, uh, then perhaps it's a sign that what you're eating is not fresh. I agree. I totally, I totally agree. But then see, I'm not a fan of mashed potatoes and gravy or gravy period. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just kind of gross. It's like, what is in there? Well, no one knows. Yeah, I know. I know. I, yeah. Everybody's got those things that, that just kind of like, no, I have never ordered that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Never and, and of course, stay away from processed foods, the usual tips, yes. and yes. It, will, it will also go a long way. Yeah, yeah, 
absolutely. One of the things though, I, I, I know that I've read previously is that raw, raw food is good for you. That's, that's fine. But if you cook like vegetables and stuff, just a little bit, it actually starts to kind of break, break down so that we can digest it better than just having it raw. And it doesn't mean it's th- that I have stopped eating raw food, but I always thought that that was, that that was very interesting. It kind of made sense. You don't want to cook it so much that it's just all the nutrients yeah. are gone, yeah. but just, just kind of enough, you know, kind of parboil it, I think is what they call it sometimes. Yeah. I, I read like this book called bit. Deep Nutrition by Chris uh, Shanahan, and she's a physician. Mm. Yes, she's really into nutrition studies, and, uh-huh. and she goes into all of that and the benefits of uh-huh. you know not fully cooking the meat because it activates certain chemicals oh, and, okay. and, and things like that. So if anyone wants to check out, feel free to, to read it. But I, I actually want to say vegetables, I think it's better cooked just from my personal uh, preference point of view because it tastes better. You know, when whenever you eat a salad, for example, you literally yeah. just eating grass. In my opinion, no offense to anyone who loves salads, but I, I can just taste grass, and my taste is limited to the dressing that I use. Whereas today, if I cook my vegetables, mm. um, I, I can have different seasoning. Uh, mm-hmm. Although it's, it should mm-hmm. be lightly seasoned, and it tastes mm-hmm. a lot better. And I, I can tell you a lot of times I have friends over from the U.S. to come visit uh-huh. uh, occasionally because they'll be like, oh, I wonder what's like in, in Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, this is before the pandemic, um, guys, because now we still have to go through a seven day quarantine when we come I back know. to Hong Kong. Can you believe it, guys? Uh, anyways, they keep, no, they ran keep over. taking it off and putting it on and taking it off and putting yeah, it on. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, oh, God. No, it was seven days. It was 21 days, seven days, 21 days. The quarantine was always there. It was just how uh, it's just the duration. Anyway, so they, okay. they came over and all of a sudden they would eat vegetables um, just because they started cooking it and there are different ways of making it so that the texture is not so just raw and, and, and fresh. So right. um, I would encourage people to actually experiment with cooking uh-huh. the vegetables. Not only do yeah. they get the health benefits, they actually will start enjoying vegetables. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, I, I totally, I totally agree. Yeah, well, that, that's, that's what kind of parboiling is. It's like you do it where they're still crunchy, but they don't have that raw taste. Yeah. Right. The dirt, yeah. the dirt taste. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And and a disclaimer: your local <laughs> Chinese, American Chinese, just that rundown restaurant doesn't count as Chinese food because usually. That's 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 kind of filled with MSG in it. So oh go to God, somewhere yeah. authentic and, and try it on your own. Um, and I'm not trying to get rid of the businesses, but also know that they're also quite oily and, and filled with MSG. Well, yeah, because they've been cooking for so long for the American taste. Yeah. Not for the Chinese. <clears throat> Although a lot of the ones in Chinatown and stuff, like in San Francisco, um, you know, if you're Chinese and you go in, they'll cook it differently than if I go in and order it. <laughs> well, even the American ones. I mean, if I go in, I just have to speak some Chinese and, and then they there you go. be like, oh, hey, it's one of our kind. <laughs> but I, I think in San Francisco, even though you just walk in, you get a much better uh, Chinese cuisine experience anyways. Um, and, and Yeah, some. It goes. Um, it, it, yeah. It, it, oh yeah. It, it depends on the restaurant. Depends yeah, on the exactly. restaurant. <laughs> but what what you need to get in practice of for everyone listening is just tell them less sauce, less salt, less seasoning. Right. Yes. And and that'll go a long way. I, I've started yeah. doing that in university actually. And uh-huh. and so I've, I've never good. been really big and and because I guess different to people my age, right? I'm 30 years old and mm. I started working out being in fitness when I'm, mm. I was in my early twenties in school mm-hmm. and people have always talked about aesthetics. They want to look good. Same, yep. same. I mean, I wanted to look good, but at the mm-hmm. same time, I also understood that I need something that could keep me in the game for a long time uh, because right. I think most injuries are results of chronic use or overuse and it, it accumulates. Yeah. And so if I drink a lot of protein shakes, if I do a lot of uh, processed stuff, nothing against supplements, but I, uh-huh. I, if you do a lot of it, because they're meant to be supplements, but yeah, I think now most people take it as it's as if it is the main meal and which is the problem. Mm-hmm. Um, so, mm-hmm. so for me, I, I'm mindful that I, I was, I, I was, I was always been super mindful of preventing that. And yeah. as a result, I, I think 
that it, it has helped um, in, in me having a healthy immunity and just yep. having now having people that can identify with this concept. Yep. Yep. No, I, I agree. I agree. And so it, on that, on that point, I think I will, uh, will, will wrap this up. Um, I think we've, we've talked about a lot of different things. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed, you know, hearing a little bit about different, different things, different cuisines, different workouts, you know, just in a lot of different areas. Um, and I think, I think the biggest thing that, that you were saying, and I totally agree, which is to be more cognizant and, and aware of what you're eating, what you're doing, how you're working out, you know, all of that, particularly as you get older, because your body just doesn't, it doesn't bounce back. Yeah, like you're right. And, and, and be more patient. Yes. Yes. That's a good, very good point. Very good point. Yep. Yes, for sure. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I, I really appreciate you being here and, and sharing your knowledge and your experience. And I will say that um, neither of us are doctors and this is not to be seen as medical advice. And if you are having a medical issue, please go and see your own doctor or go to the emergency room if it's that bad. So other than that, um, thank you again. And I will see all of you next week. Thanks, Susan.